This evening, the subject is less, well, it'll be a little bit of history, but it's less historical than simply biblical. And that is, we're dealing with the faith of the Reformation, the Reformed faith, not as you think of it. We talk about the faith of the Reformation. People think immediately of what they call <clears throat> the five points of Calvinism. If you don't know that terminology, the Lord bless you, because I want to tell you they are not the five points of Calvinism. They are five responses to five points of error that were set forth by others. But the Reformed faith is a whole lot more than those five points. They're very important because they were correcting serious error. When I talk about the faith of the Reformation, I'm speaking of the very fundamental things that moved the hearts of the Protestant reformers and still should move the hearts of God's people today. We're going to read in the New Testament Scriptures in the book of Titus, Paul's epistle to Titus. <clears throat> and uh, you will have to excuse me as I cough. I should explain to you that uh, quite a number of years ago, I had throat surgery because there was something growing there that should not have been growing. It was entirely benign as it turned out, but it was causing great problems. <clears throat> I got over that, thanks to the best surgical team in the East Coast. And uh, I was preaching in Spain to pastors. And it was a very important subject I was dealing with. And they had many questions afterwards. And I was preaching along quite happily until the last 30 seconds, I would say, of the message. And it was just like walking off the edge of a cliff. My voice had entirely gone. Uh, I was later told by my throat specialist that probably was a virus that had kicked in. Don't know where it came from. Maybe it was working since the time I went in the aeroplane across because this was up in the mountains and the air was pure and all the rest of it. But as the result of that, this side of my voice box, he said then, and I have no reason to think that it has really got any better, <clears throat> was 60% paralyzed. So I have to work from the other side. Got to be careful during the singing. If I try to sing too much, not only makes a most unholy noise, but uh, it can kill the voice. This has been a short afternoon. If I get tired, the very first thing to go is the vocal cord, the one that's left here. So if I have to splutter and cough, you'll have to forgive me. It just comes with uh, a half-paralyzed voice box. However, by the grace of God, we will get through. We're going to start by reading at the beginning of the epistle of Titus, just the opening verses of Paul's epistle to Titus. Chapter 1, verse 1. Paul, a servant of God and an apostle of Jesus Christ, according to the faith of God's elect and the acknowledging of the truth which is after godliness, in hope of eternal life, which God that cannot lie promised before the world began, but hath in due times manifested his word through preaching, which is committed unto me, according to the commandment of God our Savior. <clears throat> to Titus, mine own son after the common faith, grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father, and the Lord Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. May the Lord add his own blessing to the reading of his precious word for his name's sake. The common faith. 
when the apostle or when the evangelist Luke set out to, read, to write his gospel, he said that he was going to set forth the things which are most surely believed among us. In other words, he was at pains under inspiration to write about the common faith. That is the faith held in common by all Christians. Christians may disagree on many things. It's amazing how much we bring with us from our background, from our nationality, from our upbringing, from other prejudices. But there is a core of divine truth apart from which no man or woman can be a true Christian. There are certain things upon which we dare not differ, certain things that are not up for discussion because they are the faith that is shared, and that's the idea when we use the word common. They are shared by all true believers. It's very interesting to me when I read these opening verses of Paul's epistle to Titus, that in the first couple of verses, he gives us three glorious descriptions of this common faith. He gives us three glorious descriptions of the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. He speaks of the faith of God's elect. That is the gospel. And the gospel is what Christians believe for salvation. When he's talking about the faith of God's elect, he is saying here is a body of gospel truth which God uses to bring men out of darkness into light from the power of Satan unto God, transforming them from sinners into sinners saved by grace from people on the road to destruction to people on the road to glory. The gospel is what Christians believe to the saving of their souls. It is the faith of God's chosen people. Then he speaks of the truth according to godliness. That's a very, very important description of the gospel. It's the same faith that he's spoken of as the faith of God's elect. It's the same faith, but now he's describing it as the truth, which is after or according to godliness. In other words, the gospel is the guiding truth in the lives of God's people. Now, that's a very, very simple statement to make but it is a very profound truth that the majority of preachers do not seem to grasp. And if they grasp it, in the most cases, they do not preach it. You can take this in a variety of ways. I'm very tempted. If I were in Greenville still, they would all be sitting back for an extra half hour because they know when I say I don't have time to do something, when I was there, I usually took the time anyway. And the only criticism I ever got in Greenville was when I said, I must finish, time is gone. You're here, we're here, what's the hurry? Let's hear the word. But I'm not in Greenville, and you want to get home before dawn. But let me tell you this. This gospel that we believe to the saving of our souls is the very truth by which we must live. I remember reading in a Reconstructionist magazine, and if that name Reconstructionism doesn't mean anything to you, forget about it. You don't need to worry. But I remember reading that they said that justification is by grace. It's by faith. But sanctification is by law. And I am here to tell you tonight that that is absolute error. 
The law can tell you what to do and what not to do, but it has absolutely no power to enable you to do it. And if I'm preaching law to you, I am simply bringing you under bondage that you cannot fulfill that law simply because the law tells you to do it. In fact, the apostle Paul went even further, and he said that when the law says not to do something, the very fact that it tells you not to do it stirs up within the fallen nature of man the desire to do it. So where do you get the power to fulfill the law? Sanctification does fulfill God's law, but where do you get the power? Paul says in Galatians 2.20, the life that I now live in the flesh, and I always like to stop there. Where do you have all your problems? In the flesh. Paul even speaks of sin using our physical flesh, our hands, our feet, our eyes, our ears, very often our tongues. And in this technological age of Facebook, Twitter, and other abominations, our fingers as instruments of sin and wickedness. It's in the flesh that we have our problems. How do I deal with flesh? How do I overcome flesh? How do I get rid of the thinking of the flesh and get the the mind of the Spirit? Not by some little psychological principle to which some preacher has attached a gospel text that's out of context. Paul says, the life that I'm now living in the flesh in this body. I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. I live by the gospel. By faith I am saved. By faith I go on with God. Paul is saying, This faith of God's elect is not only the gospel that Christians believe to the saving of their souls, but it's the gospel that is the guiding truth of their whole lives. Then in verse 2, he says, in hope of eternal life, the gospel is the confidence with which believers face life and death and eternity. There's a beautiful picture of this in the second chapter of the Gospel of Luke. You read a very brief biography, but it's a very full biography of a man called Simeon. The Lord had made it clear to Simeon that he would not die before he had seen the Lord's Christ. And he took the Lord Jesus. Now, he had never met Mary or any of the rest of him. He was not uh, somebody who was in the know, as it were. God led him to this child whom he had never seen before. And he recognized him for who he was. What a picture it is of the old man. Well, we take it he was an old man. We're not told his age but he took the Savior in his arms. You know, that's what happens every time a person's genuinely right with God. They embrace the Lord's Christ. And he said, Lord, now lettest thou thy servant depart in peace. Almost everybody who quotes that quotes it as a prayer. Now, Lord, I've seen the Christ. Now let me go. But it's not a prayer. It's a statement. And he's saying, Lord, you are now allowing me, doesn't matter how long I live, but you're allowing me to depart in peace, for I've seen the Lord's Christ. 
See, this is what it is when God saves you. You can live in peace. We read grace, mercy, and peace. Do you see the order? Grace first. Theologians, systematic theologians, I should say, distinguish grace from, peace, or from mercy. They say grace is the favor of God that deals with the guilt of sin. Mercy is the favor of God dealing with the misery of sin. And you can see why they say that. If you've ever studied Latin, you will know the Latin word for mercy is misericordia. You can see the misery. And only when they are dealt with can you have peace. Another way of saying it is this, grace is God's favor. Mercy is a word that comes from the Old Testament that seems to have a very strong emphasis on God's covenant promises. And God is saying, I will be loyal to my covenant promise in giving you all that Christ has purchased. And as a result, you can live in peace. Ah, but we're going to die. Sure as you're living, you're going to die. It is appointed to each of us to die. But a Christian can die in peace. In my lot as a preacher of the gospel to be with people who have had the bombshell dropped upon them. I remember a few years ago I was lecturing in uh, Greenville. And a knock came to the lecture room door. My secretary was there. I knew there was something big when she was interrupting a lecture. And she said, Mentioning, a, mentioning a, a dear lady out of her congregation, she said, uh, Marianne is here. She would like to talk with you. I'd always told my students, you be here at a certain time. I do not promise to be here because I'm first a minister of the gospel and a pastor of souls. And there may come things that will keep me away from you and you'll have to buckle down and use the time and don't waste it. But this is a lesson to you if you're getting into God's work that people come before your plans. So I left them. And that lecture was not resumed that day. And into my office, I sat down. I usually would sit across the desk from anybody who came to see me but on that day, I drew my, side, my chair beside this dear lady, a dear friend. She turned to me, she said, I've just come from my doctor. And he's told me, I have three months to live. It came as a shock. I want to tell you, the doctor got a very much bigger shock because she just turned to him and she looked at him and she said, well, doctor, I'm glad I'm saved. She said to me, you know, uh, strange, he, he didn't say anything. He didn't respond. I said, Marianne, dear, not a bit of wonder. He is used with people saying, you must have made a mistake. I want another opinion. This can't be. That's the, the thing that's common, just denial. He has never had anybody given a death sentence and saying, it's not the sentence I'm worried about, it's your soul. For she asked him about his soul. He was wrong. She didn't have three months to live. She had just over two months. But 
oh, what peace the Savior gives. This is the gospel. You, you're saved by it. You live by it. Woe to the man who says he's saved, but lives in contradiction of what he believes. Woe to that man. But you live by this gospel that saves the soul, and you can face anything in life. You can face anything in death. And you can face the judgment of God. This is the gospel. Now, in the light of all that, is it any wonder that on coming to the knowledge of this gospel, someone like Martin Luther, after years of struggle, after years of his heart being torn apart, having come now to the understanding of this gospel, is it any wonder he had to trumpet it to the whole country and the whole continent? Is it any wonder that he was willing to face the, the bull and the curse of the Pope? He was willing to face the ban of the emperor, which effectively made him an outlaw in all society and said to any man, you may kill this man at will and you've committed no crime. Indeed, says the Holy Father, you have done the work of God a favor. Is it any wonder that the martyrs could go to the stake and they did go, and they were burned, and they were tortured. Is it any wonder they could go? Is it any wonder that the godly Hugh McHale, as he was taken out to be burned in Scotland, lifted his eyes to heaven and said, Farewell to earth. Welcome God. Welcome Christ. Welcome home. Why? Because the gospel and got a grip of their heart. The faith of God's elect. What were these great truths? They were more than opinions. They started at the very, if I could say the bottom in some ways, the top. I'm talking the bottom in the sense of the foundational truth. They started with the character of God. You see, the God who is presented in every false religion is a man-made idol. Let me make that clear to you. We are told about other religions that are monotheistic, that it's the same God under a different name. This is what the ecumenists and the syncretists are saying. Oh, what all religions, they have some good in them, some truth in them, some light in them. And after all, we're all, there's only one God. And we're, tell that to a Hindu, by the way, there's only one God when he has thousands of gods. And if he can't find a God to meet his need, he just invents another God. There's only one God. and It's the same God under different names. Don't you believe it? It's not true. Luther and the others find out that though they were using the biblical names of God, the God they had been taught to believe in was not the God of the Bible. Remember what I pointed out when we dealt a little with Martin Luther, the, the view that he had of Jesus Christ was of Christ as a stern judge. God was one who, whose favor had to be gained by the constant efforts of the flesh. That's why Luther became a monk. That's why he almost starved himself and whipped himself, literally whipped himself to death. That's why he would lie all night upon a stone floor, freezing almost to death, trying to placate an angry God. This is the God that they were taught. God was righteous. Remember what I said, that the 
The Latin word for righteousness is the word for justice. And oh, how Luther trembled. The justice of God, the stern, harsh, vengeful God who's ready to crush me. That's why he said, I know I ought to love God, but I hate him. I hate this God, even though I'm trying my best to placate him. And then he made a glorious discovery. He came to see that the righteousness, and I'm quoting his words, the righteousness of God was not the justice by which God is just and punishes sinners and the unrighteous, but it is the righteousness by which a merciful God justifies us through faith. When that dawned upon his soul, he realized salvation is all of God. Now, this will come as a surprise to many. Many people don't want to hear it, but it happens to be the absolute truth. Martin Luther was led to discover the doctrine of the absolute sovereignty of God. What is normally associated with the name of John Calvin, Luther held just as deeply, and so indeed did all the Protestant reformers. The sovereignty of God. Paul believed it. He said the gospel is the faith of God's elect. What? Are you telling me that God has chosen a people? Is God not the supreme democrat? Is God not, as we are told, in a position that he cannot treat one person differently from another? Telling me that there's some he chose? I'm not telling you anything. But that book is. That book is. John Calvin's treatment of this was very interesting. Where most people want to deal with this profound doctrine of predestination and election early in their theology as they deal with God's decree. John Calvin deals with it under the heading of salvation. And he specifically, at the end of a long sentence, speaks of how we receive the grace of Christ. Now follow carefully. Commencing with the fact that the gospel is not preached to all and every man, that it doesn't have the same effect on all who hear it. We all know that. Let me stop there for a minute. The day you heard the gospel and were brought to faith in Christ, there were others there who heard the same gospel and did not come to faith in Christ. And that led John Calvin to echo Paul's question. Paul asked this to the Corinthians. Who made thee to differ? Why is it that you came to faith? The man beside you didn't. Calvin's answer was not emotional. It was not touchy-feely. But it was very much scriptural. This is what he said, We shall never be clearly persuaded, as we ought to be, that our, salva our salvation flows from the wellspring of God's free mercy until we come to know his eternal election. God is sovereign. But here's the question. 
How are we to know God? Now, there will be some foolish preachers, and they will tell you, well, you have got to try and study to find out, am I one of God's elect? Read your Bible, man. The Bible never commands a sinner. Find out if you're God's elect and then come to Christ. Never. That's a human invention that is an abomination and should be banned from the Christian pulpit. John Calvin had it right. How are we to know God? If I could just concentrate his argument right down to this. God is perfectly revealed in the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, that's a big subject. That's the heart of Christian theology. All true knowledge of God must be Christ-centered. If you want to know God, you look in the face of Jesus Christ. The glory of God, Paul says in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 6, shines in the face of Jesus Christ. Would you know the being of God? Look at Christ. Would you know the doctrine of the Trinity? Look at Christ. Would you know the doctrine of the divine decree? Look at Christ. Would you know the doctrine of God's election? Look at Christ, for he is the one whom God calls mine elect. As the great Scottish theologian William Cunningham pointed out, ideally, there are only two men in Scripture. God only deals with two men. The first Adam and the last Adam. In the first Adam we died. In the last Adam we live. By faith. God chose Christ because of his own virtue. Because of Christ's own perfection, God could shower his love on Christ, what theologians call the love of complacency. God was absolutely pleased with everything about the person of his own dear son. He loved him from all eternity. And when he entered into a covenant of redemption with his son, he loved him as his chosen Redeemer, every other man he chooses is in Christ. And because of Christ, all that God has to say to us about himself, about his love, about his mercy, about his salvation, about his power, it's all in Christ. This was Calvin's great point. God is perfectly revealed in Christ. Christ is perfectly revealed in the Scriptures. I'll deal with that perhaps a little more tomorrow night when we deal with the Bible, the religion of Protestants. Christ is revealed in Scripture. I don't want to get into all the depths of polemics and controversy tonight, but the Christ of Romanism is not the Christ of the Bible. Romanism takes every doctrine of the Bible and corrupts it. The doctrine of the Trinity. They make, to all intents and purposes, the Trinity into a quartet. Because Mary is the co-redemptrix. She's the co-redeemer, according to Roman theology. That's a terrible blasphemy. The Christ of Rome that Luther grew up believing in is a caricature of the Christ of Scripture. God is perfectly revealed in Christ. God, who at sundry times and in diverse manners spake in time past unto the fathers by the prophets, hath in these last days spoken unto us in and by his Son, Jesus Christ is God's full and final word to man. By the way, that's how you know that Muhammad is a false prophet. 
That's how you know that Joseph Smith was a false prophet and that his so-called Mormon religion is a lie. Because Jesus Christ, according to God's inspired word, is God's full and final revelation to man. And all God has to say is in Christ. And all he says about Christ is in this book. Therefore, Calvin said, study Scripture to find Christ. And when you see Christ revealed in Scripture, like the poor, the poor sinner that Jesus talked about as the, the publican versus the Pharisee, cast yourself on the mercy of God in Christ. You know something? When you do that, you'll say, thank God for sovereign grace. Had it been left to me, I would never have chosen Christ. I'm no better than the man next to me who rejected him. There's nothing in me that's one bit better than the reprobate who curses Christ. But God. Who made me to differ? I didn't make myself to differ. This is the sovereignty of God in operation. British radio has for years had a program called Desert Island Discs. It's a way to get celebrities on the air and reveal a little about their life story. And the background is, uh, say you were to be cast away on a desert island and you could only take, used to be eight records with you. Now it would be, I suppose, eight, whatever it is you get off the internet, pieces of music or songs or whatever. Eight of those, you're allowed to bring the Bible and Shakespeare, one other book, which would it be? And... One handy thing to have with you, what would it be? That's the background. They invited Dr. Paisley to be the subject of one of those interviews. And the lady who was doing the interview, she brought up this subject, you're a Calvinist. You believe in election. She was trying to paint the picture of this harsh God. Here are a whole lot of Sinners who want to be right with God and God says, no, I haven't chosen you. Of course, that's the devil's lie. There's none that seeketh after God. No, not one. The only people who seek after God are those whom God's Holy Spirit does a miracle in. And he had an answer. I'd never heard it before. And people wanted, oh, that sounds strange. It was profound in its simplicity. He said, you can know that you are God's elect if you want to. She said, what? He said, yes. Will you come to Christ? All that the Father giveth me shall come to me. Will you come to Christ? And if you come to Christ on the authority of that book, I can tell you, the Father gave you to Christ. You're God's elect. You see, sinners are not sinners because they're not elect. Sinners do not reject Christ because they're not elect. Sinners reject Christ because they are selfish, self-centered, time-serving, devil-serving, God-hating Law rebelling on godly men and women. That's why they don't want Christ. Do you want to be saved? Are you willing for God to save you on his terms? Then come to Christ. And you'll find 
He never turns away the poor sinner who comes to him. This is where they started in the Reformation. And this is where we start. And I make no apology for that. I am 100% a Protestant of the Reformed faith persuasion. We start with the character of God. This is God's self-revelation. The next thing that was absolutely clear to the Reformers was the authority and the sufficiency of Scripture. Now, I will be dealing with that much more fully tomorrow night, so I'm not going to labor the point tonight. But let me tell you how the, the, apostles, or how the Reformers approached the Scriptures. The great reformer of Zurich was Ulrich Zwingli. Zwingli wrote out by hand the entire epistles of Paul, and he memorized them word for word. This is how precious this book was. Remember what we have come across again and again here, that this book came to us a tremendous cost. Rome's view of Scripture was very low. Oh, they said this is the Word of God, but it was hidden from the people. It was surrounded by fanciful interpretations. It was obscured by pretended extra-biblical revelations. You see how modern we are now? There are charismatic churches all around the country, and people are saying, I've got a vision. Preachers get up. I, I'm thinking of one church. A nephew of mine was going to that church at this time, uh, and the preacher, uh, he came with a vision from God and a word from God, and this is what this congregation now must do. Didn't say it in the Bible, of course, but this is the vision I have got. This is the revelation I have got. So they set about doing it, but a few weeks later, the preacher had changed his mind, and he came with another revelation and another direction from God, first one forgotten. So the question was asked, how does this happen to be? And merely put down as a troublemaker. You see, when it comes to binding the consciences of God's people, I may believe because God has impressed something in my heart, this is the will of God for me. And if I'm convinced of that as I'm studying God's Word, that may bind my heart and conscience, but it cannot bind anybody else's heart and conscience because I may well be wrong. A lot of people have made that mistake. Extra biblical revelations. Rome had them aplenty, Mary appearing. Saints appearing. All sorts of fluff and nonsense. Vain tradition. Then came the revelation of God. And the reformers stood up for the Bible as interpreted by itself. You remember the words of the, the immortal words of the great William Tyndale when he spoke to the Roman priest who was despising the, the very thought of translating the Bible into English? And this is what the great reformer said. If God spare my life, ere many years are past, I will cause a boy that driveth the plow to know more of the Scripture than thou dost. And he did it. In the history of Christianity, a book that gives you a synopsis of Christian history, the writer says that Tyndale suffered shipwreck the loss of manuscripts. Remember, everything had to be written out by hand. So the manuscript loss meant the loss of years of work. The loss of manuscripts, pursuit by secret agents, betrayal by his friends, 
pirated edition of his, in his efforts to publish the English Bible. But through it all, he persevered. Why? Because they had got this glorious truth. This is the word of the living God. Do you believe that? How then do we treat it? Spurgeon, I think in one place, mentioned people who went home and they put their Bible on the shelf. And in his dramatic phrase, he said you could take your finger and you could trace in the dust on the covers of the Bible, the word damnation. Oh, if I got up in this pulpit and said, this Bible's a bunch of fairy tales, if I got up and denied this book to be the inspired word of God, I would hope I wouldn't get finishing the sentence. I know if I were the minister of a church, and somebody got up, he would certainly not finish the sentence. He would run out of that pulpit before he ever knew it. Oh, you know the truth. But how do you treat that book? There are Christians, and they, they read a chapter out of duty. But it is our duty to read Let me give a very poor illustration, but nonetheless, one that you'll understand. You see a young man and woman and deeply in love, and they're separated. Say he's gone to war. And the letter comes through. Do you think his loved one, either a a wife or a betrothed, do you think they look at that and say, oh, I have the duty to read a page of that today? Or do you think that with heart pounding, they wouldn't open it up and say, what does it say? Oh, that we would have the same kind of love for the book of God. In Luther's day, people prepared for the priesthood without ever opening a Bible. I want to tell you, in many a seminary, it's not too different. I think of a young man who spoke of a very famous seminary, a very orthodox seminary very conservative. He said in our theology class, I never have to open a Bible. I want to tell you, I believe it's good for ministers to learn some Hebrew and Greek and history, systematic theology and biblical theology and pastoral theology and homiletics, Biblical interpretation, exegesis. Oh, I believe they learn all those things. I'm all in favor of instructing young men. But oh, my heart's passion when I'm dealing with students and as I'm dealing with myself is that we may learn Christ. Paul said, you have not so learned Christ. This is not a lesson to be learned simply in the head. When I was a student, my English Bible teacher was Dr. Paisley's father. He had been taught himself by C.H. Spurgeon's son. I don't want to be disrespectful, for I think that J. Kyle Paisley was one of the godliest men who ever walked the streets of Ireland when he said the very word God, as he said it, it put a stillness in your heart and soul. I loved him and he loved me. And I, had a, I was his only student at the time. 
And he gave me a bunch of his sermon notes going away back to the 1930s. This was a mighty man of God. But by the time I got there, he was an old man. His powers were fading. Could others have given better lectures? Yes, they could. I want to tell you, I learned things from that man that great scholars couldn't give me. I remember well, and remember I was the only student. He sat across a table from me and looked me straight in the eye, so I couldn't think it was for somebody else. I remember a day we came to Romans chapter 6. And he went down the chapter and he said, No, no, K-N-O-W. Know ye not. Know ye not. And then he, he came to verse 11. Reckon yourselves. And then yield yourselves. You see, Christians, maybe you're in this position yourself. I was. You're always, Lord, I want to yield. I yield, I yield. And you can never get anywhere. No, reckon, yield. That's the order. Know the objective truth that you died in Christ and you rose again in Christ. Know that. Then take your stand on it, reckon on it, and then you're able to yield or present yourself for service. Simple, but profound. But this was the really profound part. He said to me, this knowledge is not simply the knowledge of the head. And here are the words I will never forget. Remember, I was 20 years old, starting out. And I can still hear the venerable voice of that great saint of God. He said, young man, get on your knees before God and stay there until God burns this knowledge into your heart. It was tremendous truth. I've never forgotten it. You see, my friend, this book, this is God's holy word. For this book, men were willing to live and die because by this book they found truth, divine truth. We believe the book. Is it God's word? Then in God's name, treat it accordingly. Of course, the heart of the faith to the apostles and to the reformers was the sole merit and mediation of Jesus Christ. There is one God, said Paul to Timothy in 1 Timothy chapter 2. There is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man, Christ Jesus. One mediator. And his mediation, the mediator is one who comes between. I was thrilled this morning to hear what was read to you from the larger catechism. The mediator of God's elect, to use the shorter catechism words, there is only one mediator of God's elect. Who is he? He is the Lord Jesus Christ. He is God and he is man. In two distinct natures and one person forever. I'm not going to try and expound that. God and man. And he acts in both natures as a complete person. But there are things that could only be experienced by humanity. God is pure spirit. The old theologians used to talk about the impassibility, not the impossibility, the impassibility of God. That is a word that comes from the Latin verb to suffer, 
God cannot be made to suffer. No man, no devil can inflict injury upon the eternal God. But yet, in order to offer a sacrifice, the Lord Jesus had to suffer. Oh, there is more than suffering. There is offering. But there is, in the offering, profound suffering. And that had to be because he was truly human. See him in Gethsemane. I remember years ago, preaching upon the tears of Jesus Christ. When I came to study about Gethsemane, I realized this is something that I can read I know nothing about. And I remember those days, my early days in Greenville, I got in my little study and I cried to God, Lord, do something. I remember he did it. I can't recreate the experience or the feeling, but I cried to God, Lord, if I'm to preach this, let me enter in in a way that I've never known before. Let me enter into something of an understanding, something even of a feeling, something to let me. I can't suffer what Jesus suffered, but oh, I want to know something of that preternatural darkness, that awful agony of Christ in the garden. Never before nor since have I ever known anything like it. For God answered prayer, and as I stayed before God with an open Bible and a heart that was yearning for Him, God answered prayer. That message was unlike any other I'd ever preached on the sufferings of Jesus. And in that study, as God answered prayer, it came to a time when I had to cry, Enough, Lord, enough. I had only begun to see just the tiniest little fraction of what our Lord was going through. And I could take no more. Enough, Lord, I can't take it. What must our Savior have suffered? How must our Savior have suffered when the very blood of his body was oozing from the pores of his skin. That was an attack upon the very life of Christ. And that's the cup that he prayed, Lord, take this cup from me. It wasn't the cross. It was that cup. And God heard him and God answered prayer. That's Christ standing in and then he went to the cross. And there... Figuratively speaking, with arms outstretched, he placed one hand on the throne of the eternal God and the other upon the head of poor guilty sinners, destroying the enmity, putting away the guilt and the sin. He reconciled God and the sinner through the blood of his own cross, I want to tell you, when our Savior did that, He did everything necessary. All sufficiency of Christ means Jesus paid it all. Not part. All. That's why when John Tetzel came selling indulgences, Martin Luther rose up in Angry rebellion. This is blasphemy. That's why when another indulgence seller came into Zwingli's area of Switzerland the very next year, a, a monk by the name of Samson, that's why Zwingli rose up in total repudiation of anything that said you have to add to the work of Christ. You know, that was profound because immediately out went all the prayers to the saints. Why do I need to pray to saints so-and-so if I have the Son of God there? Why do I need the intercession of Mary when I have the intercession of the Son of God? Mary need 
needed the intercession of the Son of God herself. She called God her Savior. Away was the sacrifice of the Mass. You know, to this day, and I don't say this out of bitterness, I say it out of profound sorrow. Poor benighted Roman Catholics are told, and this is the language of Rome today, not 500 years ago, today, the Mass is a sacrifice. They use the word. It's a sacrifice for the sins of the living and the dead. They say it's not an addition to the sacrifice of Christ. It's not a reenactment of the sacrifice of Christ. But whatever way they try to explain this, over against this so-called sacrifice, you have the word of the living God. This man offered one sacrifice for sins forever. And what did he do? He sat down at the right hand of God. Now you go through the Old Testament. I remember doing a series of studies in my very early days on the tabernacle in the wilderness. It's a wonderful study. The priest offered, the priest sacrificed, the one thing there was not, and God gives you the details of the tabernacle down to the pins that held the tent to the ground. There was no place for the priest to sit down. Why? Because his work was never finished. But this man, offering one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down. Why? Because on Calvary, he said, it is finished. The all-sufficiency of Christ, the sole merit of Christ. What does a sinner need? Christ. You don't need Christ plus anything. You just need Christ. What does a saint need? You need Christ. This is what gripped the reformers. Of course, they believed the doctrine of justification by faith. I think I've covered that a little already, so I'm not going to labor the point again tonight. But I tell you this, where Rome taught justification by a mixture of grace and works, confusing justification with regeneration and sanctification, in the end bringing it down to a matter of works, and the mediation of the church, and the sacrifice of the Mass, and the doing of penance. Where Rome did that, the Reformers came to this glorious truth that John Calvin said, we explain justification simply as the acceptance which, with which God receives us into His favor as righteous men. God accepteth us as righteous. This is how our shorter catechism puts it. What is justification? Justification is an act. Underline the word. Sanctification is a work. That's an ongoing series of acts. Justification is an act of God's free grace, wherein he pardoneth all our sins and accepteth us as righteous in his sight, only for or because of the righteousness of Christ imputed to us and received by faith alone. This is it. And that's the truth that set millions of people free. That's the truth that revolutionized the church and indeed the world. When people were justified, they were led to the assurance of faith. Luther had nearly gone mad because he couldn't ever reach a place where he could be sure that God would accept him. He knew he was going to die. I have had people come to me and say, you know, this is my fear. Maybe this is your fear. This is my fear. Wouldn't it be tragic to go through life 
live for 30 or 40 or 50 or 60 or 70 or 80 years thinking I'm going to heaven and I die and I realize I was never saved and I'm sent to hell. Wouldn't that be a tragedy? Men and women under God and due to His sovereign grace we owe much to what was done in the Reformation because the basis of the assurance of faith was brought to God's people. Rome taught them you cannot be sure. It's a sin to say you're sure of eternal salvation. That's not what the Word of God says. This is real. It's available. It's normal for Christians to know that they are saved. This is not presumption. I remember talking to a lady who was a very religious Anglican, Episcopalian. Our office had a lot of work with their office. And I remember speaking to her. And she said, you say you are saved? Said, That's terrible presumption. Well, if I said it, it would be presumption. But if God says it, it's not presumption. It's truth. So we know that we have eternal life. Why? Because God said so. If you come to me, said Christ, I'll receive you. You believe in me. The Bible says you're justified by faith. If you're justified, you have reconciliation with God. You have no more condemnation. You can no more perish than Christ can. If you are a believer in him. Then, of course, they came to the glorious truth of the priesthood of all believers. You don't need a pastor or a priest or a pope to get to God. Now, don't misunderstand me. God has appointed pastors in the church. God has appointed teachers in the church. Ephesians 4 makes that very clear. God has appointed elders in the church who have spiritual rule of the church. They're going to answer before God for how they govern the church of God. As a preacher, I will answer before God and I tremble at the thought. I will be honest with you. I tremble at the thought. And I will answer before a holy, all-seeing God for how I have preached his word and how faithful or otherwise I have been to Christ and his gospel and to souls and their need. But in order to get to God, you have a direct route. The priesthood of all believers, read 1 Peter chapter 2. Read Revelation chapter 5. We are kings and we are priests. We have direct access to God through Jesus Christ. On the very same basis that he entered, so we enter. And we have boldness, not brashness, but confidence concerning his entering in so that we may enter in with confidence that God will receive us. These are the fundamentals of the faith of God's elect. I trust tonight that you've learned a little of the profound truths of the character of God of the all-sufficient merits of Christ, of the glorious grace that justifies and receives sinners, ungodly sinners, by faith in Christ, and of the absolute certainty that God gives of eternal life. May the Lord bless his word and let it bear fruit in your life.
behind them. Let's bow together in prayer.